Dit is woensdag die 6e maart. Goeienavond, ons gaan aan met een anglaas kruif. Rob was trembling slightly. All along, since the discovery of the coin, he had the feeling that there is more to it. Out there somewhere was a treasure to be found, and he was probably the only one who knew. It sounded incredible. You only have to find it. Feverishly, he turned the page and was momentarily confused. Something was wrong, and it struck him like a hammer blow. He stared at the book. Clearly and unmistakably, he saw the ragged and torn remains of paper where the pages had been torn out. Frantically, he searched for loose pages. There were none. Oh no, he moaned aloud, disappointed. Only one written page remained. The ink was different from those used earlier, and Rob could see that it had been written some time later. In between was a seizable piece missing. Almost reluctantly, he started reading the last entry in the log. January 1797. Only God knows why it must end this way, and may he forgive those responsible for it. Since the liberty went down a fortnight ago, all hell broke loose. Too many men died, and now at last I am dying too, and I'm writing this last message to whoever may find it some day, if at all. The ship ran aground just each east of a large river mouth to the south from here. I believe that the gold will be safe forever from those who had killed for it. Unfortunately though, it will now never be returned to its rightful owners because I am the only one alive who knows the truth, and I am burying it here with me in this lonely cave. I am weary and tired. My body feels cold. I know I am dying, and won't leave this cave again. But I am at peace and content with my fate. My only distress is the knowledge that I have failed in my mission. Upon finishing this, I will put it in a safe place and I hope someone will someday return the truth to Britain. With this I say goodbye. I'll be resting in peace on my grave. God save the King. Signed, Captain J.S. Martins, January 1797. Rob stared at the faint handwriting. So close and yet so far. On the very brink of a great discovery, and then outsmarted by a handful of mis missing papers. Again and again he read this last message. It was as if something was evading him, some significance, not grasp grasped, but he couldn't place it. There was only one real lead open to him. The ship ran aground just east of a large river mouth to the south, and that didn't say very much. It would be a strenuous and costly effort to locate the wreck of the Liberty. He had hoped for some kind of map, some kind of indication, at least that could have helped him to locate the position of the Liberty. It really would have helped. There was an empty feeling inside him. Empty because there was a void around the time that the ship had gone down. His hope for an article on that was gone too. And something seriously had to happen, had to have happened there. Who were those who had killed for it? Who had been responsible for this? What did Captain Martins mean by that? Munity, perhaps? Tom grunted. He would never know. These missing pages held the answers and those were gone. Maybe Captain Martins had destroyed it to hide something that had gone wrong during those last days. But what? There had to be more. He read the last entry again, but it told him nothing more. Something deeper was still escaping him. Something on that last page. He shrouded and stood up swiftly, or rather stiffly. Perhaps it would come to him later. He thought as he poured a heavy dram of whiskey in a tall glass before sauntering across to the window. In his surprise, he noticed that it was already past noon. 
Absently he sipped his drink. Of one thing he was certain. Given time, he would come back and search for that gold. The river mentioned was undoubtedly the Storms River, and the treasure wreck would be close by. He will find it. The cave the, the waves came rolling in. The sun reflected brilliantly on its blueness and white droplets flew like the mane of a wild racing horse. White breakwater rushed around the rocks, over it filling the slopes and crevices running down into the drawback of the forming through ahead of the new building wave. Conservationist Kathy Moore stood watching and never-ending Pounding waves with a feeling of deep contentment. The light westerly wind, which caused the white mane on each incoming wave crest, ruffled playfully through her long dark brown hair as she dreamed, uh, dreamed and stared at the fascinating beauty. She sighed happily, smiling unconsciously. Such a day was made for love and romance, she thought, so beautiful and part of nature. Kathy felt reluctant to leave the sunny veranda of her rondavel. She could watch the sea and breakers for hours on time without ever get getting tired of it. And that was the reason for her contentment, because she felt loved here and because she worked and lived right here on the rocky coast of the Tsitsikama River and National uh, Coastal National Park. I am fortunate, she thought, to be posted here at this piece of untouched paradise, where I can live out my love for nature and service to mankind. Her decision to become a conservationist was perhaps the best one she had ever made. The park stretched for an odd 60 kilometers along the coast, a strip of wild and untouched nature about 5 kilometers wide, with a great variety of hiking, trails and rest camps, with this one next to the mouth of the Storm, Storms River the largest. Host to the famous three-day otter trail, it provided also many short hiking paths for the casual day visitor and those who preferred not to take the picturesque longer paths along the coast. A second piece of parkland separate from the coastal strip lies just north of the N2 highway in the corner of the Storms River with tourist attractions such as the Powell Sauer Bridge and the Big Tree. Although, Cathy grinned, it was not exactly the general Sherman tree of the United States with its 102 foot waist, but it was our very own giant tree. And of course, a well-developed car caravan park was essential along the most popular tourist route in South Africa. In the small but comfortable living room, her radio set crackled to life. Interrupting her train of thought, she brought her back and brought her back to the present. She glanced at her watch. It was time to go to the main gate. With a last longing look at the blue water, she drank the rest of her slim lunch. In the kitchen, she dropped the glass in the sink and, scooping up her brown ranger's hat, she went out the back door to the Datsun. She flashed a friendly smile at Raphael, the black gatekeeper, who grinned in a white teeth at acknowledgement. Cathy wondered momentarily where he got such an outlandish name, but then remembered that black men often adopted so special work names. In her tiny little office, she found a basket full of waiting correspondence and sank behind, behind her desk with a deep groan. What a waste of a beautiful day, she thought gloomily and put the paper knife to the first envelope. Cathy looked up from her papers when someone entered the office. In his late fifties, with a bulging stomach to fit his five feet five body and friendly round face, Warden Kasper Oppermann sank into the only other chair. 
Cathy, child, he said in his paternal voice, and Cathy grinned. I wanted to take a look at this. He held out a two-page document which she took from him. A group of school children want to walk the Otter Trail, second week in October. They want someone to accompany them. But, Warden, it's hardly necessary. The trial is well marked, and it's young kids from the orphanage. They want a ranger to escort them, someone to tell them about the trees and plants. But read it. It's all there. Kathy nodded. I'll check it out. But must, must it be me? Gabby is not here that long, and as a city-born Englishman, he doesn't know all the plants and animals yet. And seeing that they are kids, I would like you to go. Gabby Wilson was the only other conservationist in the park and was only recently appointed, whereas Kathy was a senior conservationist with six years field experience. All right, Warden, you win, she said, knowing that Gabby was more than adequately qualified. She smiled at him, a mischievous look in her grey-blue eyes. The warden didn't miss it. Having no children of his own, Cathy had become like a daughter to him and Hardy, his wife. And he knew her well enough to notice the unspoken request. Okay, child, out with it, he growled and fumbled for a half corona to hide his affection. She held a flaming match to the tip of the cigar and waited until he leaned back, satisfied. The corona clamped between his teeth. I am going to check the spot for our new diving path. Without removing the cigar, he said grinningly, I know you too well, Cathy. Such a fine day, you are only looking for an excuse to get out there and into the water. She started to protest, but he chuckled merrily. By all means, go and dive. You don't really need my permission. She smiled. Only want you to know where I'm going. Well, I won't keep you, but I know Harty is making tea. After tea, Cathy added. A cup of tea with Aunt Harty was worth a couple of minutes, and as usual, there would be freshly baked scones. With a stab of guilt, she remembered her slim lunch. Well, there goes my diet. Warden Opperman laughed with a shaking stomach, and Cathy grinned shyly. Her constant dieting was a source of great amusement to him, as he obviously couldn't understand the reason for a slim 27-year-old woman to inflict such torture upon herself. It must be torture, he always reasoned as he admired her marvellous figure, to starve oneself and consciously he ran his hand over his own stomach. The scones once again proved beyond doubt that there was no one who could bake scones like Aunt Hardy. Aunt Hardy, you have to outdone yourself this time. Gabby Wilson praised the homely grey-haired wife of the warden who was also the park secretary, a real know-it-all. If anyone at any stage wanted to know something, search for a file or need to know how things had to be done, they only had to ask Aunt Hardy. Mother to all park personnel, black and white, she was appreciated and loved as such. But Aunt Hardy was also someone who spoke her mind. Now she eyed the senior conservationist dubiously. Are you still seeing Klaus? she asked, although she knew very well that it was the case. She disliked Klaus Weber for his arrogance and openly disapproved of Cathy's relationship with the burly garage owner. Well, Klaus is not bad, Cathy offered her casual excuse. He was a good businessman. He has a good business running. Is attractive and law-abiding. What more could a girl want? And grinning naughtily, she added, Sexy too. Aunt Hertie snorted. Snake sexy, huh? Arrogant and forward, yes. But watch out for him. Her expression softened. I don't want you to get hurt. Oh, Auntie, Gabby interrupted her. 
Kathy is a grown woman. She can look after herself. Anyway, Klaus is a rich man. Kathy glanced at him, thankfully. The older woman grunted, knowing that Kathy got a mind and a will of her own. Off you go, she said. I know you are dying to get into those blue waters. And remember, you are a conservationist to preserve the periwinkles. She glared at her new target. Now, li you listen here, young Gabby. Kathy laughed, relieved and gratefully escaped to the sunny outside where she hurriedly climbed into the Datsun. She departed with her us usual haste. Raphael shook his head with mild amusement. This was one woman he couldn't understand at all. She drove the Datsun to where the path ended. Carrying her dive bag, she walked briskly along the well-used footpath down to the little sheltered and shingled beach at the river mouth. Hardly a beach, she thought Riley more a protected slope. Being a weekly in the middle of August, or being a weekday in the middle of August, not many people were around. Kathy scanned the rocky shore with exp expert eyes, glanced ag across to the other side of the river, but it was deserted. And so was the suspension bridge that stretched across the river. She quickly stepped out of her skirt and undid her uniform blouse. Next went the bra and panties until she stood on the rocks naked. A quick look around showed the coast still clear and she stepped into her wetsuit, pulling the tight new print pants up over her firm legs and thighs. She slipped her arms through the short sleeves and, feeling a little wicked, glanced down at her supple body. The white plastic zipper stretched down low, allowing her vision over her flat stomach to a dense bush of dark curly hair. Kathy pushed one hand down over her body, soothing the curls against her flesh to avoid entanglement with the zipper as the other hand carefully drew it upwards. She knew from experience that it could be extremely painful experience. For a moment her hand lingered down below and Kathy was assaulted by a series of wicked thoughts which she hastily shredded aside. These indecent desires of her body she thought and closed the zipper fully up over her breasts. She was well aware of her body, knowing its attractiveness its wiles and moods. Not too bad, though, she thought proudly and looked down at her figure, almost indecent, shapely in the tight-fitting short wetsuit with her long, elegant legs protruding beneath it. And she thought of Klaus. Not everything that she had said about him earlier was true. Klaus was not sexy at all, nor very attractive, but he was decent enough and treated her with mild respect. On the other hand, she didn't know him very well, and there wasn't much between them, far less than even Aunt Hertie was suspecting. She sighed, she sighed while slipping on her flippers. The right man uh, just hadn't appeared yet, although in her mind she saw the bedraggled bearded figure sitting chest deep in the muddy stream, and her breath quickened. Only because I didn't like him, she wanted to tell herself. The sun was reflecting warmly from the choppy water in the deep river mouth. Unlike so many other rivers, there are no sandbanks and the sea water uh, enters deep up river. And the water was treacherous for swimming, laced with currents where the river and sea meet. But Kathy was a skilled diver, an excellent swimmer, and undisturbed by the lurky dangers, she slipped into the water like so often before. Of course, she wasn't considering a new diving path here. That was only her lame excuse to the warden for disappearing for a quick swim. But this spot was the best to find the delicious periwinkles, and she had promised the Crawfords some too. The water was cold on her skin. 
slightly colder than normal, with the colder river water pouring in. She fanned out into the dark waters, staring down through her mask, breathing slowly through the snorkel. Not using scuba gear, she took a deep breath and jacked knife under her long bare legs, pointing briefly at the blue sky before she slipped deep down into the depths. Fifteen feet down, she reached the bottom. Moments later, she saw the first periwinkles, its snail-like shell dark with white flecks. Cathy drew her knife. She came to the surface for air five times, and the sixth time she headed for shore with twenty large periwinkles in the bag. She was breathing only slightly faster than before. Kasper Opperman watched the swimming figure with mixed concerns and admiration. Standing high upon the suspension bridge, he was more than just concerned for his safety, for her safety. He knew these dangerous waters and had warned her numerous times, but she always just laughed. Oh, Uncle Opis, you worry too much. He watched her swimming for shore and experienced a stirring of admiration. She was an excellent conservationist, better than most men he had worked with. And she knew the coast and shore perhaps better than him. She knew the sea, a direct result of her constant diving along these parts. He saw her glancing towards him and waved. As she reached the shore safely, he sighed and continued across the bridge. She was like a fish in the water and as fit as and agile as a springbok. He grinned wryly and highly spirited girl with a terrific temper. Fortunately, they, she usually didn't lose it with him and Harty, but poor Gabby. Once ashore, Cathy dried away the wor worst water and after thrusting her clothes in a bag, she strolled back to the Dutson with her harvest. She waved at the people on the grass in front of the small cave overlooking the sea and river. They waved back. Some of the men watched her with approval, and she hastily reversed the Datsun from the parking lot. Her own, own rondavel was only a short distance away, and she stopped behind it. She glanced at her watch. It was all fogged up, and a droplet rolled lazily inside the glass. Oh no, she exclaimed. It has drowned, and suddenly she remembered Rob de Bois, whose watch had rained out a week before. And she chuckled. Kathy hummed softly as she dexterously used the chisel to clear away the dried uh, Moloch's matter from the old boss bass bell. Sitting on the steps of the stoop overlooking the sea with its waves, colored orange by the setting sun, she paused every now and then to study her handiwork and to sip from the ice-cold beer shandy. Then, bracing the ship's bow between her legs, she applied the sharp-pointed chisel eagerly, stripping the dried-out shells and muck from the dull metal. She had found the bell two weeks ago during the, a scuba dive while collecting samples of the coast east of the river. At first, she didn't recognize it, but as she was trying to loosen a black muscle, she found that the rock that the rock moved, and on closer inspection, recognized it, as well as the significant of her find, uh, significance of her find. She had searched anxiously around. She was appalled, for all around her, littering the ocean floor, were the remains of a shipwreck. Kathy had told no one and didn't intend to. Fascinated by the mystery, she decided that she would fetch out the brass antiques in her own good time. Feeling smugly content with her secret, she could already imagine the shining brass decorating her living room and office. Using a piece of steel wool, she cleaned away the finer dirt from around the faint lettering until she could at last read it clearly. It read, HMS Liberty. 
sipping carefully on her shandy, Kathy stared at the ship's bell in wonder. The name didn't mean anything to her, but at least now she knows the name of the wreck, and with mild nostalgia she wondered when it last had rung. It rang out sharply as she tapped the chisel six times against the brass. She smiled delightedly. Six bells, she mimicked an imaginary sailor. Chapter 3 Rob circled the Cortina Big Six, a wry grin on his face, as it involuntarily reminded him of Anton Goosen's Boy of the Suburbs. Complete with fur on the dash, a head-shaking dog in the rear window, and a naked doll under the mirror, the car looked like something unreal from another world, with its white GT stripes, mag tires, and ridiculous CB antenna. A bumper sticker read, Skydivers do it in the air. And another, this car is booby-trapped. And Rob knew that the stereotype deck would be the best on the market, and he also suspected that there would most probably be a few ladies' panties stuck above the sun visors as proof of earlier conquests. His own BMW appeared almost drab next to it. Grinning, Rob entered the lobby of the 12-story block of flats and took the elevator to the top floor where he got his penthouse flat. He didn't bother to use his key. As expected, the door wasn't locked and he dropped his things in the large living room. In the door of his bedroom, he stopped. On his bed, lying fast asleep on his back, was a lanky figure with disheveled black hair and a vicious-looking moustache. Close beside him, with her arm flung over his muscled chest, lay a bleached blonde with a pair of voluptuous buttocks visible under the blue sheet. Quietly, Rob approached the sleeping figure and threw a punch, but the latter was already moving and his strike wasn't as effective as he had hoped. Then he went down as the man kicked his legs from under him when he rolled from the bed. He was faintly aware of the blonde screaming as another kick came into his side. Rob grasped for air, rolling sideways through the door on, uh, into the living room. He staggered to his feet just in time to block a vicious blow. At the same time, he seized the outstretched arm, turning into him from his crouched position, jerked down simultaneously. The man came over his back, cleared it and slammed back first into Rob's expensive blow-punked hi-fi, sending it crashing down with stand and all his precious steel diamonds records scattering. Rob went in for the kill, his hands open, right one raised. Once again, the man was ready, waiting and both his feet connected with Rob's stomach, hurling him back against the door. In a blur of speed, he saw the other man's move, his right hand flicking up from his feet. Rob saw it's too late. The stiletto took him under the left armpit, rubbing, ripping through the material of his shirt, pinning him to the door. Almost immediately, another pegged his trousers. The man straightened slowly, a deadly coldness in his eyes. Rob noticed that his moustache lost, had lost its twirl. Glancing beyond the man, he saw the blonde staring at them, shocked. She was stark naked. Her breasts heavy and, to his surprise, a real blonde all over. He grinned slowly. Okay, I give up. I should think so, yes. The man's face split into a grin, and in two fluent movements he jerked his knives out. They embraced affectionately, slapping backs and then stood grinning at each other. Blondie stared at the two men, modestly forgotten. She mumbled just loud enough for them to hear. I don't, I don't understand. They grinned at her, and Rob spoke first. My brother, Herbie. My brother, Robert. And then Herbie Dubois laughed. 
Just a little ritual, honey. And he swung back to Rob. You're out of practice, brother. I must admit, Rob grunted. But then, these knives. Blondie, who had come to her senses, had put on a robe which Rob wryly recognized as his own. Now she stood looking around the living room. What a mess, she breathed. The two men stopped laughing and glanced about the place with guilt. Yeah, well, Herbie wrung his hands. A little damage? What? Sorry about the Wi-Fi. Rob shrugged. A lighter problem. First, I think we both need a drink. Just to brazen the insides. I thought you were still up at session. Herbie's face clouded. Sanctions, these bloody economic sanctions, he explained unhappily. Our one-time allies in the West are now winning the war for the communists in our own country. The mine closed down a week ago. Then I came here and I used the key you gave me. How? Oh, that is real bad. Rob pushed a beer to his brother. This damn world is crazy. Starving our people. Herbie had been chief of security of a session iron ore mine for more than 10 years, and now he's without a job. Many mines and other industries in South Africa were closing down as the Western world put their economic sanctions to effect, depriving not only the whites against whom these actions were aimed, but also, and to a much worse degree, the black and colored people of South Africa. Yeah, he thought bitterly, with friend, friends like the West, who needs enemies? So you are out of work, Rob, Rob growled, suppressing his emotions, watching Herbie over his beer. Yep, and it doesn't look good. I save a little money, but once that is gone, then what? Rob nodded grimly. We'll win, Herbie. In the end, we'll be okay. And as an idea suddenly occurred to him, he asked, This woman? Well, I picked her up last night. Herbie was embarrassed. She's taking a shower, I guess, and then I'll call her a taxi. Good, because I have something serious to discuss. Some, something that might give those forms which we've already been dreaming about. Do you have money? Herbie looked dubious and Rob shrugged. Patience, brother, pray patience, and he smiled at his brother's confusion. In his pocket, his fingers fidgeted with a gold coin. Perhaps Herbie's unemployment came just at the right time. I have no place to stay. Herbie stared, stared uncomfortably at his beer, avoiding his older brother's eyes, feeling a flash of humiliation in saying it aloud. You have a place. Rob replied briskly, hating to see his brother like this, at the same time feeling compassion. You stay right here, he declared. You can take the spare room. We will share the rent and other household bills. He saw the relief on Herbie's face. Anyway, this place is far too large for one person, he concluded. And from here, it's only two blocks from Riley's gymnasium, where we could do a bit of a workout. He grinned as new interest began to flicker in Herbie's eyes. As you said yourself, I'm a bit rusty. Also, he paused. From here, we can plan our um, excursion. Herbie stared curiously at him, but his brother stopped the unspoken question before it came. As soon as the girl is gone, meanwhile, here's to our new partnership. Rob ripped another can open. Herbie smiled. To our partnership. I'm dying to learn more. Rob silently placed a single gold coin on the counter between them. Gerie die rest van jou aand en ek gaan morgen min of meer hierdie tyd weer vir jou voorlees en doen. Dankie dat jy subscribe, like en share, as ook vir jou ondersteuning in die comments en financiële bijdraas. Mooi aand!